Um, I'm Bridget Wheeler, and I'm the Artist Services Manager with Milwaukee Film. I hope that all of you are having a fantastic time so far, and also thank you for being here today. Um, a few quick housekeeping notes. I'm sure you have seen the Double Up Challenge that we are doing again this year. Thank you to the generosity of David, Joan, and Susan Lubar. If we raise $100,000 during the festival with your donations, new memberships, and April and May renewals, the Lubars will double it up, meaning we could stand to raise $200,000 by the end of day 15 of this festival. So text double up to 44321 or go to milwaukeefilm.org slash double up or slash members to become a member and help us reach our goal. So without further ado, I will plug some of the panels next weekend and then I will bring up our panelists for today. Um, next weekend on Saturday um, at the East Library, we will be having a master class with Sam Pollard, so please do not miss that. That will be at 3 p.m. And then on Sunday, we will be back here at the incredible Pomona Cider. Thank you, Pomona Cider, for hosting us. Um, yes, please make sure to thank them and tip your bartenders. Um, we will be back here on Sunday um, at 1 p.m. with a panel called So You Made a Film, Now What? Distribution, Broadcast, and Alternatives. Followed up by, um, let's see, at 2.30 p.m., finding the funding from grants to investors and beyond. So I hope you join us for those. But then also, at 2 p.m. today, we will be having another panel on film festival strategy. I will be talking with a few filmmakers, both local and from around the country, um, about their film festival strategy and how that's worked for them, do's, don'ts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now I will do stop talking, and without further ado, I'd like to bring up today's panelists, and we'll start. Well, Mar, I will have you introduce everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming, um, and enjoy the cider and the hospitality here. Thank you so much. Um, I'll introduce myself, then I'll let everybody introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Mara Garvey. I'm an Irish uh, documentary producer. Um, I came to the States now two years ago. Loving it here so far. I started off in Chicago, came to Milwaukee, preferred Milwaukee, and now I live in Milwaukee. Um, so I'm um, more of a kind of creative producer, and I also specialize in legalities around filmmaking, so any contract work um, for distribution agreements, for people you hire, for all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, and I will pass it over to Rishi. Hi, I'm really pleased to be here at the Milwaukee Film Festival and on this panel. Uh, my name is Ruchi Mithal. I'm a producer. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I would say that I am also in the creative producer category. Um, you know, really, from I love conceiving of a project and seeing it all the way through. And so, you know, for me, I'm usually there before the beginning of a project until after the end. So. Um, I try and choose projects, you know, based on something that's going to be interesting for that amount of time and also that I think is going to be meaningful. So I'd say I don't, I'm not in production for production's sake, but because of the stories that I want to tell. So. Hello, I am Risa Sanders Weir. I live in Chicago. I've been there for about 30 years, but I'm originally from Arkansas. And um, I am similar to the other two producers here and being a creative producer, often I, for my sort of bread and butter work, I'm working on projects where there is no director, it's just me as the producer writer on um, generally like PBS style projects. Um, I am also someone who is heavily into like the legal side of things. I teach a class at Columbia College in Chicago called uh, legal and financial options, which I subhead as the class no one came to film school thinking they wanted to take, but shouldn't leave without taking. <laughs> and, uh, and I am a, a passionate fair use uh, uh, proponent, consultant, so on and so forth. Yeah, and I think as well it's important to kind of, we were chatting earlier about the, produ the kind of producers that exist and the kind of producers that we're not. So there will be producers that specifically concentrate on funding for your film um, and executive producers and all those kind of producers. So I think the three of us come from a very similar space in that more creative side and Risa and I share the legal side and I'm sure Rishi you have to do it yourself. Uh, <laughs> right, right. And then we were talking earlier about how when you're working in the independent documentary space where there isn't a lot of funding, you do have to do a lot of things yourself. Um, so even Rishi, you, you both have films in the film festival. I think maybe talking a little bit about the kind of producing you had to do for those specific films, um, if you want to. 
Um, so the film I have here in the festival is called This World Is Not My Own. Uh, okay, so the film that I have here in the festival is This World Is Not My Own. Um, it is um, an independent documentary and it's about a self-taught artist, Nellie Mae Rowe, who lived and worked in the Atlanta area. I hope you can all come and see it. Um, this project took just over six years uh, to get here to this road of sharing with audiences. Um, and I'd say for me, most of the projects I've worked on in my career over 10 years have been kind of like commissioned projects. So they already had a home. They were already going to be on a platform. I got to come in and not have to do the fundraising and all of that stuff. But for this one, even though my previous life is as a grant writer, I never tell people that because then I'm going to be writing everyone's grants. I very select. Oh, shoot. Now everyone's going to know. Um, but anyway, so, you know, on this film, um, it's interesting because while those other commission projects often had larger budgets and a home and more infrastructure and support, this is the film I'm really the most proud of um, because we got to make it the way we wanted to and took the time, which is like the magical ingredient in a time-based medium like a film. Um, we got to take the time we wanted to do it. So, and. Be, we also had a very clear, I think the directors and I, the directors are Petter, Ringbaum, and Marquis Stilwell, of who was doing what and um, had a real clear delineation of our roles. So that is so helpful. We were on the same page. I knew what their vision was. We were always making the same movie. And I think one of the challenges can sometimes be when people are making different films. <laughs> As a producer, I think too, you know, sometimes you have a lot of responsibility, but not the ultimate agency, and that can be a challenge. Um, and you really care for your subjects and, you know, not to say that others don't, but you're just invested in a way. So I think this film was really special to me because um, we had the time to really work together. And so for this film, I, um, I'm also the co-writer of this film because there are some scripted elements. Um, in the documentary and uh, so I sort of did everything from um, shaping the story um, and being a storyteller not just for the story you see on the film but communicating with funders, communicating with um, audiences, communicating with other stakeholders about what this film was. It's hard to describe, you know, we're doing these animated things and this artist and we're going to have an actress and a motion capture and but this is a documentary, you know, so just figuring out how to tell the story of the film um, was a big part of my job in addition to the story in the film. And, um, and then there was fundraising and uh, those aspects um, because this was an independent um, endeavor. But I'd say it was, it was just extremely enjoyable, this one, yeah. Thank you. Um, the film that I'm here with is a short film called Guaranteed and Gary, which is part of the homegrown shorts. And um, this one was completed at the breakneck speed of a year and a half, unheard of in the documentary <laughs> world. Um, and part of that reason is that it was somewhat unusual to me in that the subject matter approached us. and. Um, the, the organization that was giving the guaranteed income trial uh, reached out to a colleague of mine. Then he reached out to, my, to me and my two partner filmmakers that were working on another project and said, do you guys want to come on board to do this? And um, we did. We um, you know, had like three weeks until they started giving out the, the guaranteed income gift. So it was very breakneck pace. And we didn't know what the project would be because we didn't do that sort of usual front end stuff where you're like conceiving, what is this? Why are we doing it? And so forth. It just seemed like a really great opportunity. And um, so we filmed as if we were making a feature film and um, uh, about mm, two thirds of the way through the year, uh, we had the opportunity to apply for the um, Firelight Grant which I did write the grant, but I don't want to write anybody <laughs> else's grant. Um, <laughs> and, and that was for a short film, which actually ended up being perfect for the process. You know, and, and I think like what you're talking about, everybody making the same film, mm -hmm. like we had to come together and say, you know, are we okay with turning this into a short film? Is it, can, you know, and it actually was a perfect fit. But yeah, I mean, that's so much of a producing is just like talking to, <laughs> 
everybody and making sure everybody is, you know, because there's nothing like having um, dissent that uh, will like throw a wrench into a project in a way that you just can't, sometimes can't overcome. Um, for that project is very, very small to begin with. I'm actually the location sound recordist on everything <laughs> on the film and additional camera work at times. And um, so, I mean, it was very, very grassroots down in, you know, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it. Because when we started out, we had no money. And luckily we did own the means of production, um, but the money that came later is what helped make it become a film because, you know, we are all passionate about what we do, but it really can't be done without funding. <laughs> And, and so often that does shape the project. I think for this particular project, it was perfect, it worked. Whereas I, I see projects where people like try to fit their project, their square project into a round hole because there's money. Yeah. And often that's, you know, that's a hard choice to make as a producer of whether you're gonna move forward in that way. Um, that being said, I'm trying to think of like producer stuff that uh, <laughs> has to do with this film. Um, it was a pretty straightforward uh, project as far as, as producing. And um, so I'll just leave it there and we'll move on to another yeah. question. Yeah, so I um, mean, and then just to speak a little bit, my producer experience has been mostly on international co productions. So it's also dealing with everything my colleagues are saying and also. PMing, so production management, which literally means booking flights, getting location rights, getting all that kind of thing, um, which again, on a small team, like everyone has to fit into what, delineate roles for sure, and one person can do two jobs, but being very careful around, you almost have to do those two jobs on different days because it's different parts of your brain, it's different, you know what I mean? Um, and the, I'm currently working at Cartemquin Films where we have over 20 films now in production and it's a different type of kind of producing and production management it's very much we're not on the ground with them but we're very much supporting and I was kind of like producing for me is like fixing the director's crown before she knows it's crooked like it's very much while it's you know, we want it to be upfront, we want it to be the face of the film, we very much 50-50, maybe even more where there's no director involved in terms of creative process, but it is, it is fixing problems where does everybody on the crew know, need to know there's a problem to fix? Like maybe that is more not as productive as maybe just fixing something and then can move it on. So yeah, there's been, I think we've all had can, can I bust in with my I'm favorite yes, my favorite bit of producing poetry uh, that can be credited sort of to uh, former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Um, <laughs> there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. Right. And to me, that's what producers do right. <laughs> all the time yeah. is you know the things like, okay, I know we've got to, you know, go to Gary and we've got to go to these people's houses. That's a known known. I, I know how to do that. An unknown unknown is what the weather is going to be like if we're shooting outside. And unknown unknown are the things that you can never anticipate. You know, uh, I don't, I, I'm not coming up with an example at the moment. But yes, like yeah. I, I've, I've had people say to me in the past of like, oh, you worry too much. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. worry too much is when you can't function because you're worrying. Right. Worrying to anticipate problems is producing. <laughs> yeah, I feel like worrying enough is the producing. Worrying an appropriate amount and not unnecessarily worrying other people because they can just get in your way of fixing problems, I yeah. find. Um, yeah, and I think something else we wanted to speak to today was around a sustainable living as a producer, how that works, how we've done it, um, that kind of thing. So, Rushi, I mean, I've been talking a lot. Do you want to oh, speak no. to a little bit about working in New York? <laughs> living, so. Well, you won't own anything ever if you live in New York. <laughs> so if that's important to you. Um, uh, well, at least I don't. Um, you know, I found... In New York, though, it's like it's a big city. The documentary community is still a relatively small one there. Um, a small group of dedicated people um, who just love documentaries is what I've found for the most part. So 
you know, I haven't actually, and I find this to be the case, not just with me, but I haven't had to seek out a project um, really since I've started doing this because it really is like a word of mouth situation. You work with people and one job has sort of led to another. And, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I, I only do this, I only work on projects that mean something to me, um, you know, so I, like I personally, other people might work on a commercial, for example, to like make money so then they can go do the passion project. And I completely respect that way of going about things. For me personally, I don't want to work on a commercial, <laughs> you know, like if I, I would rather just go do something else, like be a massage therapist or, you know, something. So, um, I choose my projects really carefully based on the subject matter and also the team. Um, but I have had the good fortune of being able to just sort of have that word of mouth. And, you know, each project has had really wonderful, talented people that kind of I've taken with me or followed to other places. Um, and so I have been able to make a living at it. Um, I think that, you know, also working on some of the bigger productions I've talked about has allowed me to keep doing that. Um, and this project that I'm here with, the, this independent project, was always, it was never a full-time job. So there's always been, like, the producing job and then this project. Um, but I don't know how to not throw my whole heart and soul into <laughs> to each one. <laughs> so I just think it's the only way we can keep yeah. doing this when you're doing everything from, like, you know, um, trying to mend family relationships of subjects when things fall apart to, you know, someone has given you a photograph that's like the central piece of your film and then the day before it's going to air, like, wants to take back the permission or you're de-shining a bald cop's head, like, it's all very glamorous. But, or you're conceiving of, like, a very big way to tell a story. Is that If you're going to do all those things, I think you have to be passionate. Um, about it, and so, you know, the making a living part. Um, I mean, the other thing I'm gonna say about this is it's, it can be challenging. Like, some of the challenges that I've found in it are that there isn't really, like, a lot of transparency about what people get paid. So, I think that's something that needs to be addressed because, like, I've been on projects where there have been associate producers who are doing the same job and getting paid different rates because they asked for different fees and so I find that to be sort of unacceptable you know there has to be transparency and some standards um, after this many years I've learned how to advocate for myself but when you first start especially like as a young woman it's not the easiest thing to do to know what to ask for so I feel like part of my job now is actually mentoring younger people who are coming in and making sure that they're paid fairly and learning how to advocate for themselves but that's something I would push for in this area and also with producing I've seen that um you know oftentimes we get paid like a day rate right or a weekly rate and if you don't work a day you don't get paid for that day but if you work seven days in a week which you often do you don't get paid for those extra two days either whereas other roles have overtime and things like that or a flat fee that a director might get so that's an area that now when I take on a job, I sort of say, well, I'm going to have this higher rate unless you want to pay me for the hours I'm actually working. And nobody wants to do that because it's a lot of them, you know? So I just think that there is, um, there are some places that we could really improve um, how producers are paid and how the work is valued. And producers often tend to be women so I think that's a part of it as well and we need to look at those areas but I feel very grateful to be making a living doing something I love this much it's just we can do better I'd love to, oh sorry we said go ahead if I may oh, part of the other reason why I'm here on this panel is representing the documentary producers alliance uh, if you guys are involved in documentary and you uh, sometimes or often have the producer hat on I highly recommend this organization uh, we uh, put out a crediting guidelines document a couple of years ago. We put out a guide for the documentary waterfall, which is just like how money comes in and how money goes out in a sort of like, you know, true accounting procedure kind of way. And uh, soon to be uh, released is a labor guidelines document. 
I've had a chance to read a draft of it. It's pretty close. I'm not for sure when it's coming out, but it does give like actual dollar amounts. <laughs> like this is how much you should be paid by the week or whatever. And it's, it's never going to be perfect, but at least it is a, a very good accounting from the members who are actually working of what is being made and what is realistic to be made. Um, I'm also uh, answered a question for somebody recently that they were like, how much should a director get paid on a project? And it was a, a half a million dollar budget project. And um, I wrote back and I said, my rule of thumb, which, you know, any in, in specific project has its specific needs, but as a rule of thumb, the director ought to get paid 10 to 20% of the entire budget, to which I also threw in there, and that's what the producer should be paid as well. <laughs> because it is really a job in parity with what the director is bringing to the table. And often the director can be there for a shorter amount of time than the producer is. Not always, but sometimes. So, I mean, that's kind of information. Whatever the perceived budget is of your project, that's a good rule of thumb to start from. Because a project may be very specific and have its own specific needs that would make that lower or higher, but at least you can start out with that's where the, the ballpark is. And, um, you know, like she was saying, it's, you know, it's often hard to stop working because you're so passionate about what it is that's happening. Um, I have the benefit of coming from a dual income household, though sometimes I've been the, the, the you know, person who's holding down the farm income wise because my husband is also sort of in this business. Um, but that is stabilizing to a certain degree. And uh, while I can't say that I'm, you know, just I can just work on my own projects for, you know, <laughs> for not being paid, I can't do that. But it, I think it is a reality of this business that, I mean, I also teach at three different institutions, adjunct, which is, you know, its own sort of story about being underpaid. But, <laughs> but at the very least, it provides a foundational income for me because I think working in the Midwest and being trying to, as hard as I can to stay in the independent space, there are less fully funded projects than exist in New York or LA, or at least that's what I'd like to think in my own brain. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, it's, it's cobbling together a, a livelihood that is, you know, sometimes takes up more brain space than I wish it did. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely agree. And I feel like um, my kind of experience has been in a few different places. I was in London for six years and producing there. Maybe a little bit similar to the New York spaces in like there are a lot of films that are funded. There's a very supportive community. It's super competitive. Again, I'm sure like New York. But I was able to work on more commercial projects. I liked doing it just for the experience of that and then also making space for the projects that I was super passionate about. And I think as well to know that, I mean, I tell younger filmmakers who come to me for advice, good or bad, they listen, I speak, um, whether they take it or not. But it's also knowing your worth and knowing there's a whole in, I mean, the intern and what they get paid is a big debate. And all, so is also when you come out of film school, if you go to film school or you're trying to start off and you have a different degree, coming out and being like, what, what should I work on for free? And then people exploit that. You know, people will say, well, your name will be in the credits and we'll give you a DVD. And like, please, you can do that if you're comfortable and you're supported. If your parents are supporting, your partner is supporting, you have another job, that's fine. But there's a line you need to clearly draw under that to be no. Like when I, I didn't go to film school, but I did a course um, about 10 years ago, which got me into doc filmmaking. It was at Ealing Studios in London. The name brand was there. Um, and when I finished that, I was like, looked up. I was, I was production managing at the time. I'd never production managed anything in my life, but I know my way around things. I was older when I went into it. I was thinking, what in general in the commercial space do these people make in a day? That's what I advertise myself as. I didn't make a caveat saying, I'm new. Can I please hop on your film for free? Mm -hmm. And I got work. So it was like, no, I'm not saying that works for everybody. It worked for me, but it's definitely knowing your worth and knowing when it's okay to say no and when it's okay to take the projects that you're passionate about 
and you don't mind working on them for free or for very little money. Um, or when there is a budget, it's knowing the schedule of payment, right? So you can sign on, it can be fully funded. You may not get paid as a producer for a few months or a few weeks. It may not be, you know, your bi-monthly salary coming in. Um, that's also something definitely to consider. Um, and as everyone, like one knows as women, it's important to talk about salary. It's important as awkward as it is, talking about money and financing and how you're supporting yourself. If people don't talk about it, 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 we're like it doesn't work out well for us because it's like a secret you know so I'm I'm a proponent of being open about especially in the creative space as women working to be open and honest about how we pay the rent how we get haircuts and highlights which are very expensive so yeah <laughs> yeah um what else were we going to be chatting I, about? I would like, maybe? if I may, just oh, going off do. of what you're saying, Absolutely. talk about budgeting for a second. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to advocate for uh, the International Documentary Association has a budgeting template that is paired to an article that came out in the documentary magazine about four years ago. It is a fantastic template budget. So if you are looking to budget for the first time, it's a great place to start working from. Um, as a, um, I, I'm assuming we've all done budgets before. I don't want to make that yeah. assumption that, that that's been part of our job is creating that budget. And uh, especially when you're going out to grant fund, the people who are receiving your grant materials are also usually very capable of reading a budget and seeing if your budget tells the same story as the story you say you want to tell in the, the written text. And I think coming back to pay for producers and so forth is if the staff on the film isn't being paid, I think that that's a red flag right away of like, yeah. will these people be able to sustain? Will they be able to finish the film if the producers already, who created the budget is already underpaying right. and undervaluing themselves yeah. in yeah. the budget? So I, I have worked with a lot of filmmakers on budgets and um, usually, like they're coming in and they're trying to like get as small as they can into the smallest amount of money. Yeah. And if I could just get, you know, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, I could make this film. And it's like that's actually not beneficial to you necessarily for a feature film. I'm talking about, I mean, right. short film, whatever. But for a feature film, it's like most grant funding organizations are going to look askance at that feature film budget if it's not at least $250,000 and probably needs to be closer to 400000 as like an entry level budget for a feature film. Now, you may not raise all that money yeah. and you may make it for less, but as far as telling the story of how you're going to make that film, generally that's been like a rule of thumb and right. with inflation today it may be <laughs> higher than that now. But, um, but I think that like that part of what producers do, which is taking whoever's the creative vision, if it's your own or you're working with a director or you're working, whoever you're working with and being able to translate that into numbers yeah. uh, is, you know, that is a necessary part of, of producing. Definitely. And as well, it's like if you are looking at a budget and you're being small as a producer, the, a funder is going to go, if you're not advocating for yourself, how are you going to be advocating aggressively as you need to for the film and to get other funding and to get people on crew paid? You know, it's a, I feel like it, I definitely agree. Like the, any treatment, any story, each line in the treatment needs to show up in your budget. It's that straightforward. A budget can be creative as the treatment, you know. So, yeah, pay people and value yourself. That's the takeaway from this section of the talk I think yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely um, and I think too talking about stuff we like like we've kind of talked about difficulties maybe a little bit and where we came from but maybe if we talk a little bit about what we love about producing why we think our personalities suit producing I feel that's super important too um, especially when you're working for little slash no money sometimes <laughs> we should you want to uh, sure <laughs> um what do I love about producing? I mean, I, honestly, it really is, it, it's about relationships. I truly love people. I'm truly fascinated by their stories. You know, I think real life is way more fascinating and bizarre and interesting and beautiful than anything I could ever make up, you know? 
And um, it's such a privilege to be able to be let into people's lives, doors open to you in places all around the world that they wouldn't otherwise, and people let you in. Um, I don't take that, you know, lightly at all. And, um, you know, sometimes I think I talk to more people in one day than most people talk to, like, in a month or a year. I don't know. Sometimes you're just... But it's fun. I enjoy that. It's something different every day. There's a lot of MacGyver kind of brain that you need to be using. How do I do this with that? And um, it's exciting. You thrive a little bit on a little bit of madness, I think. Um, and just the constant having to figure things out with people. Just ultimately collaborative work, um, which I really enjoy. And, you know, I've made a lot of lifelong relationships, both with the team members, that I've worked with and, and subjects for that matter. In fact, while I'm here in Milwaukee, there is a subject of a film that I did in India where I couldn't go because it was during the pandemic. So I did it produced from afar with a local crew, but he's staying in my apartment right now. Um, so, you know, you build those kinds of relationships. And, you know, in addition to um, kind of the budgeting and life's, you know, what it takes to do this, I think as a producer, and this maybe applies more to some of the bigger projects when you have more networks and executives and layers of people involved, I think the subjects are what make a documentary. You can't have a documentary without them. Um, they are actually at the center of it. And I, I find myself in the position thinking a lot about the ethics of how we work with subjects, how we treat people, what are we asking them, what are we taking and what are we giving, you know, um, and really centering that because I think it can get lost, especially in the bigger productions where I might have been interacting with the person for a year and then maybe a director or another executive has only been interacting them for a week. They're not going to have the same investment or understanding of that person's reality. Um, and so I think it's just something that I really treasure and I think is precious. And I think that um, try and always communicate that to other members of a larger team that like we always have to remember who's at the center of this thing and why. Yeah. Um, I would say yes to everything you just said. And so I'm trying to think, what else can I add? Um, because I don't want to go over the same material. I think one of the things that I love about producing is I, I am a person who loves to have lots of plates spinning at all times and multiple projects like I I do thrive on that um, I think also one of the things that I really enjoy is like where you were talking about like being good to the protagonists and and keeping them front and center I also think on a larger project where comments are coming in from stakeholders, be those funders or whomever, that being able to sort of bring all those in, saying, ha being in the position to say yes and no, and bringing that back to the other creatives in the project, be that the director or the editor or so forth, because often you need a gatekeeper who understands the whole project to be able to say to someone that that comment, that suggestion just doesn't work and to shield, especially your editor when you start getting edit notes, <laughs> to shield them from some of the things that are coming in that can be distracting because they really don't jibe with the vision of the creative team. And I, I really love that 360 global view work that producers get to do. Um, and, uh, you know, it sounds like I'm, I'm a very dark person, but I will say like, uh, the, all the dreams that I remember when I wake are all anxiety dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I rarely have a dream that is not an anxiety dream. And I, but I don't find, I don't, I'm not an anxious person. I, I right. just say it's my brain working through that. And so I don't have to like do it. it. Yeah. Care don't have to do it during the day. But, um, you know, the, the dream where you're going to the airport for your international flight and you forgot your passport, like that is, I have that dream on a monthly basis, it seems like. Um, but again, I think it's that sort of like, that brain of like trying to like crunch through everything that can go wrong and, right. and, and tamp it down so the best things can come out of what is there. Yeah, yeah I agree with what you both said, absolutely, and then not to be repetitive on that. Um, 
for me, I love the problem solving nature of it. Like I will always start with the yes, and then I work my way down. So I figure out, yes, we can do it unless it's an outrageous thing. Yes, we can, and then you usually get to maybe we can, then a no, and then we'll go back up to maybe, and then we'll all try to make it happen. Um, echoing then, obviously, with the, um, I mean, the relationships are key. Relationships to your participants. Relation, like some of my closest, closest friends I've made on film crews. Like in London, I lived there many years ago, but we're still super close as a unit, people I've kind of worked with there. Um, and also, it's an adventure. Like, I feel I've been in places, communities, met people I would never normally meet in my day-to-day -day if I had a different job, whatever. I mean, and I will say the MacGyver aspect of it, love. Like, one of my favorite films I worked on um, was called The Runner. Um, it was about a runner from Western Sahara, and we filmed everywhere. We filmed in the camps in Algeria. We filmed in the Pyrenees in, in France when he, on a training mission. And in that location, I ended up in the Pyrenees in France on a bicycle with the bicycle trailer behind me with the director in it with a steady cam. I was pedaling and I don't know if you know this but the higher you get in the mountains the harder it is to breathe. If you attach cycling a gentleman director and a steady cam to that that's a fun time and we had like and we're following the runner through this forest path. It was where else would you do that? Legitimately for your job, for work. You had a reason to be there. You weren't just a crazy person in the woods. Um, so it's adventures like that. Definitely the problem solving aspect. Um, love it, yeah, and, and all the relationships. I feel like it's, and, and I will say, I think this goes to, speaks to filmmaking in general. There's this kind of mystical element where you're either good at it immediately or it's not for you or you can't do it. I will say, particularly for producing, I feel like that's more of a personality than it is. You can learn everything that you do in producing very much like Google it, meet with producers, go on courses. But it's definitely a personality that you have for producing, I feel, and the type of producer you are. Um, so it's not to underestimate any of that and to be like, there are so many capable producers that will say, oh, I'm not sure if I'm a producer. Go ahead. Reset. Can I jump in on jump that? Jump in, please do. So if I, I, I agree with what you're saying, yeah. but I think for a long time, even I undervalued what producing was. Oh, anybody oh, yeah, can produce, sure. you know, blah, 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 yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Cause you talk about people, oh, you're so talented at that. Oh, you're so talented yeah. at that. I was a couple of years into my career where, and when I was like, wait a minute, I am really talented at organizing things. And that is a legitimate talent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I've done a lot to like develop that talent and work on that talent, but I need to value the fact yeah. that there are other people who can't take a you know, spreadsheet that has 18 tabs in it exactly. and, yeah. and keep track, you know, it's just, or, right. or figure out how to break it down so it can be organized. I mean, I think that's such a huge part of producing. Oh, absolutely. Is yeah. like this thing, like you're saying, yeah. start with yes, and then like, yeah. you know, yeah. the part of that to me is what you're doing is you're organizing the yes, task. 100%. And saying yeah. like, okay, well, yeah. we can't go yeah. here in February because right. it won't work, right. you know, and then yeah. back up yeah. and, you know. Yeah. So, you know. Oh, and I agree 100%. So if you're good at organizing, you can be an amazing type producer, <laughs> basically. Like, but it's, yeah, it's just looking at kind of like, demy not demystifying is the wrong word maybe, but it's like looking at what you're good at and if you want to produce, that could very much fit in with what a producer does and your kind of your own talents that you've honed outside of film, outside of creative work. I feel like if, you, if you're a party planner, if you're like a wedding planner, tell me some aggressive wedding planner wouldn't be an amazing producer. I feel like, yes, yeah. you know, it's like that, you know, so, yeah. Um, I think we're going to, we're going to open it up to questions, yeah. if anyone has yeah, any yes. questions, or, um, we should be able to get it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I will answer it from my point of view, sure. and you guys can. Um, so, unless the funding, for me, unless the funding is coming from a distributor, so somebody who is, in essence, you know, pre-funding the project, and then they do have editorial control, um, because that's, the money comes to you in that way, 
um, if it's a grant fund or so on and so forth, or especially if it's like an, because in documentary, we're always looking for like aligned organizations that, right. you know, <laughs> you're interested in this subject, you right. know, give me some money. And I think the conversation always has to be, you can't have editorial control. Now that sounds aggressive and like blah, blah, blah. But then I explain to them, if you have editorial control, then the documentary world is not going to value the journalistic standards of my project. So a, a presidential library that will go unnamed that's being built in Jackson Park uh, in Chicago, um, <laughs> they wanted Cartemquin Films to do a sort of uh, the building of the library, so on and so forth, and they were like, and we'll fund it. And I was like, okay, because I was working with Cartemquin at the time, and I said to them, but you can't have editorial control. Like, you can't tell us what to do. And they were like, but it's our money. And I, it was a very good conversation. And so it took a while for us to, like, you're asking for a fundraising video to be created and a promotional video to be created. And that's a different thing than a film that will go into the festival world and the distribution world and will win awards. And, you know, there are yeah. awards for promotional videos, too. But what they were looking for was, a, you know, Sundance movie. And, um, and it was a very productive conversation. They didn't end up making the video. <laughs> so, you know, that's not what you want in the end. But it was a process of explaining to them where the value comes from them not being involved. Now, that being said, I come from a, a perspective that Cartemquin very much holds dearly to, and this can depend on what kind of film that you're making. We always have stakeholders look at a film at a rough cut stage, or I'm sorry, fine cut stage. Not final, but fine cut stage telling them you don't have you can make comments but you don't have editorial control we don't have to do your comments but if there is something that we've gotten wrong mm -hmm. if there's a level of subtlety that we've missed yeah. we want to know and fix it and that's not and that's where sort of documentary and journalistic standards kind of mm -hmm. deviate a little bit now if i were making a film about a politician or somebody else who's in power i wouldn't extend that to them mm -hmm. But if I'm making a film in which there is a power imbalance between myself and the protagonist, always, always, always give people the chance. That doesn't, that's, but I think it's like adjacent to your question. Yeah, I mean, I think that you answered that very well. And I, you know, um, so for the film that I'm here with, This World Is Not My Own, the way the film came about was actually, there is a foundation in Atlanta called the Judith Alexander Foundation. And that foundation's mission is to pre preserve the legacy of the artist Nellie May Rowe. Uh, Judith Alexander was Nellie May Rowe's gallerist, and they were friends. So they're members of the families of both these women on this board. And they actually came to the director saying, we want to make a film about Nellie May Rowe. And we're you know, basically in, p asking different filmmakers to pitch us on it. So as we kind of learned about the artist, got really fascinated by her work, um, you know, I think the foundation had in mind a more standard 30-minute talking head sort of standard biopic kind of documentary. But we just said, if we're going to do this, it's going to be a feature. It's going to take an ambitious, out-of-the-box approach that this subject deserves. She deserves a treatment like that. Um, and we want you guys aren't going to have any control over it, even though it's your family members. And they were, they were like... You know, it took a series of conversations about it, but I think that what we were able to communicate is like, if you let us do our thing independently, we can use your expertise, but it's not going to be a puff piece or a promotional piece for the foundation. People will regard it differently, and it will also allow us to do what we do. Like, everybody should be doing what they do best, essentially. So the foundation are not the best filmmakers. Uh, at the same time, we needed them to help us get it right. Like, you know, especially making an animated version of an older African-American woman. I mean, I don't think we see that very often. It was very important to us to get it right for the family to be able to weigh in on what this character looks like and sounds like. And so they were great partners, but we had to make it really clear. 
And just having clear boundaries, even though it's like difficult at first to say no, it actually serves everybody way better later. Just setting up a clear container of like, this is what we're doing. Um, that's what you're doing. And I think you can just point to like the integrity that's necessary on both ends. Like we have to have the integrity as filmmakers. We have to be able to go to people and say like, we made this decision for this reason, not because we were influenced by what this organization that gave us money wanted us to do. So awkward, but so much better in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just to like totally agree, you both said it so, so well. I think it depends too on your goal for the film. Like it's, for me, when I'm approaching kind of grants and foundations, and I think it's especially true, maybe the European and Irish kind of landscape, most people who give you money are investing in you as a filmmaker. They're, they're also investing in the project and they're investing in that. But it's like, if they don't trust you as a director, as a person to make the film, and they're wanting to come in with suggestions and then we want to make it this way, then they're not right for you. Like, then you're, you know, so you just walk away from that. But I feel like a lot of grantors will, it'll be you that they want. It'll be you as a filmmaker, your next project, your project after that. You know what I mean? The subject matter that you're maybe speaking to that no other film has spoken to before, an angle that hasn't been taken. So I feel like it, and it is definitely conversations. Like it's all, it's not a quick email. It's not a yes or no, have a conversation. There's so many, they might say, We'll give you this, but we full control. Don't say no straight away. Hop on a call at them. Meet them in person if you can and say, look, here's why we're making it this way. Here's my thoughts around this. You got to trust me to make this. And then it's a confidence after that and kind of going in and, and being confident with your own story too. Um, so yeah, I think it's a totally legitimate, it can be awkward, like, but it, 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 you have a legitimate standpoint to just say, no, thank you. If you're going to have control over this, I'm out, you know. Honestly, yeah. in this case, it was so rewarding because the foundation and I, are, we're, we're all so excited about where it landed because we trusted each other, you know, so it goes a long way. Well, thank you for this. Um, what are some of the out-of-the-box funding ideas that you have helped your filmmakers with? <laughs> the problem is once you've done them, they feel in the box. Right. Whew. Um, one random one I did on a film, and we made, I mean, it was minimal money. We, well, we not minimal, we made about $5,000. Was It was a short we did in London. I was producer, kind of director in a little bit. We had like, I don't know, worked with the company there. And I, I make things, so the subject matter was about um, this musician in London, yada, yada. So to raise money, I made guitars, like these little cigar box guitars, super easy to make. I'm not a fancy person. But we sold them for like 150 pounds each. And we made enough over six months that it funded this particular part of the film. Now that's a pretty unique case and it's a very minimal money and it was a lot of work. But it definitely opened up the thought process around Outside of fundraising campaigns, which people always underestimate the work that goes into them, I'm anti them right now, that's just a crazy amount of work. It also opens up like, there's nothing off the table in terms of what your subject matter is, who's involved, be thinking so widely about that. Um, I feel too, in my most successful kind of outside of the box fundraising um, kind of things have been, if people are paying for a very specific thing in the film. So you're paying for a week in the edit suite. You're paying for this scene that we want. We need this type of camera. We need to go to this place. You as a person or you as a group of people will be responsible for exactly this part in the film. People love that. And I, I, again, I'm talking outside of the bigger grantors and the kind of funding, the whole production. So for me, it was like just thinking about fun, quirky ways around that. Again, very low key, very you know, minimum money, but, but yeah, just sparked some ideas. So, uh, I did think of one. I have a friend who, uh, film makes and he funds his films from the, um, oh my goodness. The, the word is like, uh, the tourism, tourism boards. 
from wherever it is lo- the story is located. Mm. Now he's someone he's a he's a full time professor, so he has access to cameras and editing equipment. So he's looking for a minimal amount of uh, budget, but it's an interesting tact. I mean, he will get like $5,000 from this town's tourism board, $5,000 from the one next door, because his story, he does mostly historical documentaries. And so his story is going to drive people to come to those locations. So it, it's just an interesting, like trying to think of who the stakeholders are in your film existing. Um, I've got a project right now, it's not really funding, but I think it's kind of aligned. Uh, I have uh, a project that I've been wanting to make for a while, and I'm trying to think of like, how can I benefit the people who I want to come on board and make the film? And they're, you know, in the end also then who the, will widen out the, who's interested in the film being made and that is going to an oral history project and getting them to come on board early to archive the interviews, the raw interviews from the project, which it's a history of a, of a, of a thing. And so I think that like that will be very appealing. And I think that will open up ways for me to fund the film because now the film becomes sort of like just a node on the way to having this thing documented historically in a way that they wouldn't be able to do if the film wasn't being made. And so I'm hoping that there will be people who will fund organizations that will fund the interviews being made, like Mar is saying, um, so that they can be archived. So I'm coming into my first documentary after a very successful career of journalism, offering books, um, for communications, podcasting, uh, running a PR company for 20 years. So uh, I'm combined with a couple of very talented people, one of whom is in the room. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a great team that's come together to pursue this documentary, and it was an opportunity to kind of tapped on the shoulder, um, so we have some different seat funding, and now we're uh, very picky to grant funding. But I was curious about a documentary that's taking one and a half years versus six. So what are sort of the cautionary tales, and what can you do to avoid that extended timetable? You know, kind of nice. <laughs> do we know? <laughs> well, this one is short and a feature, so that might right, be part yeah. of it. That's uh, part of it. You know, the length of the film, and then also we had COVID in the middle, so that added a couple. Of, but, but as far as timeline, I guess is the question. Um, when you have, for example, if there's a reason that it needs to be done in a certain amount of time, whether that's there's something in the world like the anniversary of a certain legislation, or you know something like that, or just you know, a budget consideration of, you know, we are going to be able to sustain this project for this long, or um, I need to follow somebody for six months in their life to capture what I'm trying to capture. So I think it's working backwards a bit from what the, what is the story demanding, and then figuring out, well, okay, this is how long I need to tell the story over this time, and then working from how long. Um, but if you know, you know, so I think I don't know, the length of time is often determined by what the story itself and the subject matter is going to be. And what kind of, are you making a short film, a series, a feature length film? Those are some of the considerations. In this case, six years served it, you know. Cautionary. No, 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 we don't. Um, uh, I, do. <laughs> I have a cautionary tale. Um, I. One kind of a very significant feature I worked on in Ireland, I set up my own production company, was the first one that I worked with that. And a filmmaker had been working, the director had been working on the film for like three years before I came in, and then they wanted a connection that I had, so I came on as producer, and we worked on that film for another three years. And it was very much like, for me, being able to tell the director, this story is here, but it was very much around the director, I was a younger producer at the time, the director kind of leading the charge going like, you can, everybody knows, you can rewrite and redo everything. It will never be perfect. So it's just kind of trusting outside of where there is a specific deadline or a specific story, like she was saying, following somebody, 
knowing and been confident that, yes, you've captured this, but I feel like it's very important if you don't have those ties to a chronological like events that you give yourself a certain amount of time and then you reassess at that point but be very strict with yourself. So say for example you're starting development to you want to be end of production. Give yourself 18 months. Say like a year after a year and a half, I'm going to see where I am. This is from like beginning. You will at that point be going into the edit. You may still have some production work to do. But I feel like as a rule, generally, while it's very hard, this is now for a feature, short, whatever, it's very hard to give an exact for different projects. But as a general rule, I like to give myself a set amount of time, reassess at that point. And before you reassess at that point, write down what you're asking yourself. Have I covered this? Have I spoken to this person? If the answer is yes to all of those. It's likely your story is in there. And then maybe spend some more time, like spend longer than you thought you would spend in the edit. Do you know? Again, I caution with that. Give yourself a finite amount of time in the edit too, because again, you can go over and over and over the story, be like, have I just had one more thing? Have I just said this? You know, so I would start off with a point to reach and check in with everybody, yourself, your producer, um, everyone at that point. Risa. Can I? Yeah. yeah sure. So one other thing I would say is the type of story. So like oh, yeah. a, a, a known known, like, OK, this person was born then they died then we know what their, you know, basic impact is that we're trying to communicate. You can put that on a schedule yeah. and you can fund for that on a schedule. I am part of a project that started in early late October 1999. We conceived it as a, uh, a verite film where we were following subjects. Uh, it's, it's not going to turn out that way because the, we were following people who got licenses for dispensaries for recreational marijuana in Illinois, and it was uh, social equity applicants. Uh, through reasons that are way complicated. They didn't get their uh, licenses for two and a half years. So we have two and a half years of people waiting to get licenses. <laughs> That's not a very interesting documentary, let me tell you. And, um, you know, so we knew when we, well, we didn't. We were like, we're making this film. It's going right. to be done in three years. We're going to stick to it. You know, and then the subject matter, because for that kind of film, you can't really get grant funding until you know who your main characters are. Right. And we didn't know who was going to get a license because it was a lottery process. So like, there are kinds of films that you just can't contain. Yeah. But then there are also subject matters that you can and, and you have to because otherwise, uh, I, I can't, I'm not going to get the quote just right, but art is never uh, finished. It is just abandoned. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Or something else gets in the way and you're just, I'll quickly finish this because I've got this other exciting project to do. You, stop you just have to stop. And <laughs> no. when you stop, no matter what you stop, it'll be fine. Like, it'll be like it'll, It's all fine. And another thing to note is nobody's waiting for you to finish the film. So you have to be disciplined. Like nobody's dying to see it. That's the reality. <laughs> Nobody cares until it's finished and until it's out there and then everybody will be talking about how wonderful your film is. And then it will be an instant success. Exactly. You know? But before and then, <laughs> and you don't want to be with your friends, oh, gee, are you still at that? That's like six <laughs> years later, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I feel it's different for everyone, but definitely going in, have just a general check-in with yourself for after a time. Yeah. You're standing there you're like we've run out of time. Because yeah, I know this conversation can keep going yeah. and I do not want to like a film, let's cut ourselves off. Yes. Some lunch. Oh. So here's a menu. <laughs> but also, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for coming to this panel. Yeah. Thank you. And now I know for if our panelists are able to stay, stick around, please. If your guys are able to stay, ask more questions, interact. We have another panel at two, so stay, get comfortable, get some more drinks, talk to lovely staff of Corona Cider. Thank you all so much again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, bartenders. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. No, thanks. Thanks for the questions.